welcome to Chat Off the Mat, the podcast that explores the journey of healing and self-discovery, where energy, spirituality, mind, and body intersect. Hi, I'm your host, Rose Whippich, and I invite you to join me as we explore ways to invite more holistic practices into your life. We will feature experts and practitioners who provide insights, tips, and practical advice. From Reiki to Qigong, chakra balancing to shamanism, this podcast will be your guide to understanding how these practices can lead to more harmony and greater energy. Whether you're seeking stress relief, emotional balance, or a deeper connection to your authentic self, Chat Off the Mat will provide you with insights and inspiration. So let's start discovering the possibilities that lie within you. Do you know that Reiki can heal karma, trauma, and past life experiences? That Reiki is not ordinary ki or chi or life force energy, but a higher level imbued with spiritual wisdom. And that we all have the gift of intuition or inner guidance, and we can cultivate a greater relationship with it and use it along with Reiki to guide us. In part two of my chat with William Ran. We talk about those topics and the birth of the World Peace Grid and his trip to the North Pole where he placed one himself. You don't have to be a Reiki practitioner to listen to this chat and enjoy the conversation that I had with William. His antidotes and love and respect for Reiki may inspire you to learn more about Reiki healing and become a practitioner yourself. Hi and welcome to the second half of my interview with William Lee Rant. In the last episode, I mentioned that I took some training with William, so I wanted to share my story about meeting him. I have always wanted to take a class with William, but he was either in Hawaii or Michigan, and I had young ki- younger kids, so the timing wasn't right. I was a member of his organization and a Reiki master teacher practicing, and then COVID came along, and that changed pretty much a lot of things. I could have taken online training with him, but I was furthering my education at the time in yoga and Qigong, so I was doing other things. But I still put it out there that one day I would take a class with William in person. One day I receive a a newsletter or an email from the uh, International Center of Reiki Training and saw that William was going to teach a Holy Fire 3 Karuna Reiki Master Class at the Omega Institute in Rhinebeck, New York, which is about two hours away from me. And it was going to be in September of 2022. So I signed up right away. I knew that the timing was spectacular for me. That summer, I got my twins ready to go to college, got them all packed. That by the time the training rolled around, they were settled in college and It was just me and I was ready to do something different, to take a break, to go on a retreat. And this training was already scheduled, so it was perfect. Driving up there, I was so excited. I had never been to Omega. It's absolutely beautiful and very, very peaceful, very spiritual. So I was really excited about meeting him. After getting settled up there, uh, we went to the dining hall. A bunch of us all walked over. And in line before the dining hall opened, we all waited and there was William and I was starstruck. I was like, oh my God, that is William Rant. Super excited that he was so close to me in front of me. And then, you know, we went inside, I got my meal, saw that William was sitting at a table uh, by himself. So I walked over there and anyone that knows me knows that I will walk up to people and say hello and introduce myself. So that's what I did. And then I asked, may I sit and have my meal with you? And he said, sure. And that was it. So most of that week, I sat having breakfast, lunch, or dinner with William and different people at the table, really got to know him better, learned uh, a lot more about him, and just found out what a great person, a humble person, a funny person, and really authentic person, really, really a, a lovely individual and his energy was just amazing. My whole experience there was amazing. I met so many wonderful people there and the the training was just life-changing. So I just wanted to share a little bit about how I first met William and I'm really grateful that he agreed to be on this podcast. So once again, here is William 
Lee Rant. I want to touch base a little bit on you mentioned uh, in my, in the training and, I, and and also in the past that I've known you that you did past life regression on others. And past life re regression can uncover a person's karma or old wounds that they're currently dealing with. How do you feel Reiki can help heal the course of that karma or current wounds or situations that people are experiencing because of that, like a, an ancestral healing or past life healing? Well, Reiki can heal on all levels, including ancestral healing, uh, healing karma, healing past lives, all of that. And uh, it, uh, you know, Reiki is um, life energy, which I was mentioning before, life energy itself. But it's interesting about ki or life energy is it can be influenced and guided by our own mind. And so uh, also ki by itself can be uh, healthy or unhealthy. So with um, ki, you can have um, bio ki, which is unhealthy key and gen key, which is healthy key. So, and then we also have Reiki, which is another type of key. So actually in the study of key, you'll find that there's so many different kinds of key. I've, I've got a book here too on that. Um, let's see. You're like it? a library over there. Yeah, I got, uh, I got <laughs> out some books. So uh, let me, oh, here it is. Yeah, A Brief History of Key mm. <laughs> or yeah. key. This is, um, I think the Chinese- Yes, uh, Qi. Version. Yeah, Qi. So a brief history. And hmm. so, um, yeah, oh, quite interesting about it. But um, it's been around for a long, long time. And it was, you know, came from uh, China and uh, possibly even before that. So um, in looking, I was doing some research on uh, the development of humanity or the Homo sapien species, which we are. And it actually evolved around 300,000 years ago in Africa. And then uh, they were there for a while, and then eventually they started to uh, travel, migrate, and then they went out um, to Europe and Asia. And so uh, the Chinese have always known about life energy and uh, healing. And at first they uh, quite a bit used it in the martial arts. And, um, but even in the martial arts, there was actually a meditation that you would do and also healing. So martial arts has a certain amount of uh, uh, focus on healing and uh, meditation. And then uh, also there was a, a faction of that group that uh, decided they wanted to go into the spiritual only and then temples were created and um, through the, to the, for the development of higher levels of ki and um, so, or qi, as they would call it in China. And then they, uh, they discovered something called ling qi, which is a higher qi. So a human being can create certain levels of, of qi or qi within themselves. But um, Einstein said something very interesting. He said, in order to solve a problem, you have to think on a higher level than the, what you were thinking on the, to create the problem. So um, as an example, uh, getting a knot in your shoelaces that didn't take hardly any thinking at all, but then to undo it, you got to really focus and you know take some time to undo that knot. So that's like an example of taking more time and using higher consciousness to solve a problem. But uh, Reiki uh, works in that way. So Reiki is not ordinary ki or chi, but it's a higher level that uh, is imbued with spiritual wisdom. So mm -hmm. the ki is being guided by spiritual wisdom. So there's the intelligence of it, and also the energy. So um, the energy then, you know, guides Reiki to, to heal. So um, they developed this Ling Chi, which was a higher level. And um, that was in China a long time ago, like yeah. 1600 BC or so. And then uh, that migrated over to um, Korea and eventually to uh, Japan. So Japan got it around 400 AD. Uh, but um, at that time, there, it, there's a question about whether they had attunements to go with it or not. Uh, it's possible that they did, but uh, we don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. But then, um, but the, that's the kanji characters. And so uh, the kanji was there. Now, uh, let me show you the kanji. A lot of people aren't aware of this, but um, in Japan, they used what's called uh, kanji to, um, was the ancient 
writing style. And here is, are the kanji characters for Reiki. So we have re and ki, reiki. Now, um, a very interesting story mm -hmm. about where the, where the idea of ki came from. So, um, of course, they ate rice in uh, China, and um, they had a pot in a lid, and the rice was in there with water, and it's, it starts to boil, and the lid uh, pushes up, and a little spurt of steam comes out, and they saw that. And they thought, oh, the essence of the rice is in the steam. And that's where they started to develop the idea of, of chi, this invisible force that's all around us. So, um, so when we see this character, this is actually the symbol for rice. And this symbolizes a pot with a lid. <laughs> so oh, cool. that's where um, chi or chi came from, the idea, yeah. concept. Right. So this is um, the, uh, you know, came from the boil, the pot of boiling rice. So, um, and then this character, Ray, is, uh, has to do with higher wisdom or consciousness. Hmm. So these middle uh, rounded characters here uh, are the healer or shaman and they're mind, body, and spirit of the shaman. Hmm. And see the little lines going up. That's like the shaman reaching up like this. Right. And um, above, these are like clouds, but they really represent higher consciousness, higher wisdom. And they, these lines are the levels of uh, like rock in the earth, like deep down, this very solid earth. Wow. So the idea is the shaman reaches up and brings higher consciousness down to earth. And so this would have to do with the ray aspect. That's ray and then key. So hmm. it's life energy being guided by higher consciousness. So Anyway, um, and that started in China a long time ago and uh, possibly goes all the way back to the origin of humanity. And who knows, now before that were Neanderthals. So who knows, they were actually quite smart. They weren't dumb. <laughs> and so most likely they probably had healing methods too that the Homo sapiens picked up from the Neanderthals. So uh, healing probably goes way back for hundreds of thousands of years, even yeah. millions. So, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, And, and I know I I practice Qigong and I'm a Qigong teacher and we learn about um that symbol, actually, with the rice and, and the steam. And that oh, yeah. represents the life force energy and and gong means skill or work. And it's a way of working with our energy. Right. Yeah. And we and everything is energy. So, you know, and, and like you said at the beginning, uh, energy represents personally how we feel. We can be sluggish. We can be really happy, and we, you know it all depends on how we're feeling. So everything is really about energy. Um, and and you and what's funny is I hear the word all the time now. Even when I'm watching basketball with my kids, they talk about the energy around a certain three point shot or <laughs> the energy oh. of of the audience. <laughs> or it's, it's constantly being used. So. I guess it's a good thing because, you know, transitioning just... into the, yeah, the, the higher <laughs> awareness of things. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think it's great. It's fabulous. Um, yeah. So, so I know that Reiki, you know, back to, back to, we were talking about past life regression, that Reiki or Chi has been around a long time, but, but Reiki also, there's a way that we can heal our past through symbols that we use mm -hmm. in, in environments. So the Hansha Zay Shonen symbol is a way that we can heal past um things in our lives whether they're past life or even past when we were younger like trauma there's a lot of awareness around trauma childhood trauma um so reiki helps to heal with that it's not just what's happening right now in my body mind or spirit but we can also send reiki out into the future and heal or um i'm not gonna say heal the future but but just send it out for for the intention that whatever we want it to be, you know, it works out in in a certain way. We talk a lot about the intuitive guidance uh, that you've used or you've received from others. You seem to be aware of visions or messages and in, in guidance. Like, can you talk a little bit more about how people can tap into their own inner guidance? Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, that's a good topic. I think everybody has some level of intuition, inner awareness. Now, the problem is, though, that in society, we're not 
you go to school, we're not taught about that at all. We're taught about how to use our, our logical mind to figure things out, solve problems. We're learning math and physics and chemistry and uh, you know business uh, school and all that. And it's all about your mind. And, um, and they don't focus too much on your intuition and so it's always been there though, it's in the background. And so it's a matter then of being willing to trust and try out this new way. And if you have an inkling about something that you think you, it was a way to do something better uh, and you try it and it works, that means you were using your intuition. And so intuition is really um, the creative force that's in everyone and all of the inventors and scientists and all those people have all used their intuition and um, and they have different words for it and different methods that they use. But yeah, the intuition is extremely important. I, I wanna talk about something that you've developed and it's called the World Peace Grid. And yes. yeah, it's it's very special and you've placed it in different parts of the world. Can yeah, you talk? My camera a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. You have one beautiful one right there in your home yeah. in Michigan, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about how that concept developed and um, where these grids are and, and how they work? Yeah. This is a um, a real world peace grid, and uh, hang on the wall there. And so, well, what happened there is that um, I um, became a Reiki master, was teaching, and then. I heard, uh, I was uh, interested in uh, having some artwork done and I heard about uh, this man, Alex Gray, who was an artist and he had done some very interesting types of artwork. And then um, I found out that he had gone to the North Pole to meditate. And I thought, oh, wow, oh, oh, <laughs> hey, wow, that's, oh, that's a, something, you know? And so then I actually talked with him and actually started working with him and he uh, did some painting for me. And actually, this is one of his paintings in the background. I there. see that's beautiful. Yeah, the, the Temple of the Great Beaming Light. So mm -hmm. we collaborated together. This was when he wasn't so famous. And he, he actually would work with, you know, now he only does his own work. But then he was very open to finding out specifically what I wanted and then making what I wanted. So we did our, you know, drawings back and forth and everything and tuned right into it. And then he produced the work of art. And then um, I have the original here and, uh, you know, we've made posters, we have posters of it and all that. And so uh, he signed it and, uh, you know, I, he gave me the actual rights to make copies and sell it and everything. So, um, and then he went on to become like super famous and they actually have a, a museum of all of his artwork now. You can oh. go and see all his, all the things he's done. And um, anyway, uh that's where the, the peace grid came from but uh he inspired me about going to the north pole and so i said oh i want to do that too <laughs> and so then um i didn't know how but i was reading national geographic and there was a, a a story about a group that was going to the north pole by dog sled and the guy's name was there and so i looked it up and lo and behold i got the phone number i called i got his wife and she said oh he's in the garage working on a dog sled i'll, I'll let you you can talk to him and I said, hey, can I go with you guys? He goes, oh, yeah, sure. Wow. <laughs> and uh, I, yeah, I go, what? He just said yes. yes. <laughs> so then he said, but there's a group. Uh, you call this phone number because there is an actual group you can sign up. And they, they like, you go to the North Pole. They take you to North Pole. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't actually right with him. So I did that. And, um, you know, they sent, uh, sent information over to get how to be prepared. It was on a certain day and everything. and then. Um, we, uh, I was actually in England. I flew back, and uh, to New York, and then to um, Yellowknife in Canada, and then up to Resolute, which is a town. It's the furthest, most um, uh, small village where they have a landing strip where airplanes can actually land. Mm. And uh, we went up there, and their, their uh, landing strip is made of uh, a gravel because there's permafrost that melts and freezes and a uh, concrete or asphalt runway would all crack up. So it's like gravel. And then um, we flew up there and the plane actually had retractable skis in case it had oh, to land cool. on snow. And um, we went up there and uh, we had to wait though for the right moment because they everything's by according to the weather. 
So we stayed in this Quonset hut, a great big building that's kind of a semicircle. So we waited until finally said, okay, let's go. So we got in the plane and took off and flying up there. And um, I, it just was fantastic. And wow. I had read these uh, adventure novels when I was a boy and it was just felt like that. And we were in the plane and they had to take seats out and put 55 gallon drums of extra fuel. And they said, oh, by the way, this plane just barely has the capability to get where we're going. So we have to carry extra fuel. So I go, oh, that, that's reassuring. Okay. So anyway, <laughs> but then we're flying and you just hear the sound of the, uh, the plane and you look out the window and it's all snow and ice as far as wow. you can see going up and down hills and mountains. And there's no villages, no, no streets or roads anywhere. And it's just wah, you know, going like that and going up north and wow, that was amazing. And then, um, um, let's see, what did we do? We got to, um, we landed to be, to, for re, to refuel and um, then they said, well, the weather's changed. We'll have to stay here a while. So we stayed there. And uh, then uh, there were guys that lived there. It was a weather station. Um, and uh, so they didn't have a lot to do. Say, so hey, we're going out to check the iceberg. <laughs> so uh, you want to go? So there, uh, there are these fjords that's, uh, you know, water, but in the winter or even in, in, like when we were there in May, it was frozen and there was an iceberg frozen in there. So we went on a, a half track out to the iceberg and uh, then we got, we chipped some of the ice off and it was like so interesting. There's no bubbles in or anything and um, came back. And then finally it was time to go. And we took off and we're flying toward the North Pole. And um, there were, we got, we were over land, which is different. And then we got over ice. It's frozen uh, ice. And the, there are what are called leads, which are cracks in the ice going way off. And we're just flying along and, um, we got to a place called Tankery, which is this very remote kind of um, station. And we landed there and they had some buildings. We went inside for a little while and they had, uh, there were uh, dog sled dogs there, uh, penned up, like chained up. And uh, interestingly, there was a female and they chained her off far away. And all the dogs are like trying to get to the female and barking and everything. <laughs> and uh, that was funny. But then we finally, we took off again and, um, uh, flew out, and what happened was the dog sled team, actually the same one I talked to on the phone, didn't make it to the North Pole, and so uh, we were going to land and pick them up and then take them up with us to the North Pole, so we landed, we got the dog sleds and the dogs on the plane and took off again, and we went up, but when we got to the North Pole, it was too foggy, and um, we couldn't land, so then, uh, but I've got the peace grid with me, and this guy says, can't you just like fling it from the window? <laughs> like a Frisbee? Go, no, no, this is psych sacred. We can't, I can't just fling it like a Frisbee from the window. It's going to crash down there or something. Um, and so we went back, but I was trusting. I was trusting right. something would happen. So we go back to uh, Resolute and land there. And then I talked to the dispatch. She says, don't worry. I'll get you on another plane. There are other planes going up there and I'll get you on another plane. So I just hung out there for a week or something. And then uh, they got me on another plane and the guy was uh, walking to the geographic North Pole, which is different than the, the uh, no, she was walking to the magnetic North Pole. Uh -huh. And where I was going to go was the geographic. So the magnetic is where all the lines of magnetic force are going down through the earth. And she says, would the magnetic pole be okay? And I go, yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so then I go, now I see what happened. I'm supposed to, because that, so anyway, so I went up there at the magnetic pole and the people I went with, they went off to talk to their friend and I had lots of time to go off by myself. And I had it all worked out that up there, the ice is only six or 10 feet deep, or, uh, you know, thick. Right. And in uh, late summer, it all melts and everything you leave, it will fall down to the bottom of the ocean. So I created a float system with a big block of uh, balsa wood, ah. and that's a very light type of wood, and then some heavy, uh, not exactly rope, but heavy string going around it. And so I went off and I dug, a, I had a trowel too. I dug it down into the, the snow and I put it there and I did, um, now ah. I did uh, Reiki on it. And um, 
then I buried it, left it there with everything all set up so it would gently float down to the bottom of the Arctic Ocean, which is mm. 14,000 feet deep. Wow. So, so uh, <laughs> yeah, so I did that. Wow. And um, I thought, I, you know, flying that, I go, oh, man, oh, I'm done. Oh, I did it. That's fantastic. It's great. <laughs> Oh, uh, you know, it just felt really good and complete and everything. But then yeah. in the back of my mind, it said, it's not balanced. So um, it was, uh, my mind was saying, well, you got to have one of the South Pole too. So that, that, what, that led me to go to the South Pole. I put one, one in Jerusalem also. There's one here. There's one at the center on Ma uh, Maui. And there's one actually on Mount Kurama uh, on, in Japan where, you know, Asui discovered Reiki. So, um, in fact, that one is special because we met the monks at the temple and they were really interested in it. And uh, I had an interview with the head monk. He was in charge of the whole thing. And uh, he was very honored that we would leave this with him. And uh, so I, you know, uh, had an interpreter and everything, and then we left it there. So now it is in their holy place. There's a, like a main temple on, the, on Mount Brahma. It's in their holy place. And uh, uh, we did to take some pictures and then they put it into the, the sacred area where only the monks go to meditate. So uh, it's up there on Mount Brahma. Wow, that's fantastic. Wow, it's, it's amazing how everything worked out synchronistically for you on that trip. And it was yeah. meant to go where it was meant to go. And, you know, I find it that I've heard this story a few times and, and every time I, I learn something new, but every time I just say to myself, dang, you know, William just does what he what he's meant to do you get the message or you get that feeling and you do it and it works out because it's meant to be yeah yeah it, i'm being guided and the energy is you know, backing me up and yeah yeah it's all it has worked out really well i'm and, very happy <laughs> and, and this it, and it's the power of reiki and and yeah. you know these are examples of, of how reiki works and and i know yeah. that i believe you you have um regular ceremonies the world peace activation or where you gather yeah. all the Reiki. Can you just tell us a little bit about how that works? Well, once a month we do a meditation uh, where we send Reiki to all the peace grids and uh, people have cards, you know, this is all over the world and it's at 7 PM on the middle Wednesday of each month. And we have a list of the actual dates on our website. Yep, I want to share that. Grid and they're there. And then everybody gets together on the middle, the middle Wednesday and they send Reiki to all the peace grids. Yeah, so mm -hmm. that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That's that's great. And I know that it, I'm going to put all this in the show notes. So uh, even if you're not a Reiki practitioner yet, uh, you can check everything out and and under and and have a, a look and see what it looks like and and learn more about the the peace grid. So well, I'm going to wrap this up by asking you about your school. We haven't talked about it. Uh, yeah. The International Center for Reiki Training has been around a very long time. You're the president and uh, founder of it. When I teach, um, I use the manuals that you wrote that are, I wouldn't use anything else because they're just mm -hmm. very comprehensive and wonderful. Um, yeah. Uh, can you just, just talk about, you know, things that you offer or anything else you want to talk about regarding the school? Yeah, well, we um, we provide uh, things for people that will help them practice Reiki, and we we want the best for everybody. We want everyone to do well. We want everyone to be guided by Reiki for their life and for the Reiki practice. And so, uh, we like you said, we have the manuals available. We have class out outlines on how to teach, and we offer classes also. And mm -hmm. so, um, I've trained. Um, well, in our system, uh, we've got what they call, we call our licensed teachers, but we also have a, a membership association, and the first level is called affiliate, and that's for anyone who has Reiki, is a Reiki master from any lineage. It doesn't have to be our lineage, but you have um, decided that you want to use our manuals in our outlines, and that's affiliate. And then the next level is professional, and the professional level is for people who took their training from one of our licensed teachers for level one and master. And then um, there are other requirements around that too. They're listed on our website, but then they become a professional member. And then, like I was saying, there's the licensed teacher that is uh, more, more thorough and takes a longer period of time. 
So to be a licensed teacher, it takes about three years to complete the program. And so you need to take all your classes from one of our licensed teachers. You need to review them, you know, all the classes, and then you need to co-teach each of the classes with your mentor, which is a senior licensed teacher. And then uh, there's a paper for you to write, a test to take, and there are other things too. And they're, they're all listed on our website. Yeah. And so then uh, your first um, license to teach one and two, so it doesn't take three years for you to get going. So you you can get licensed for one and two, usually in about a year. Some people do it faster, but, and uh, so then you can start teaching one and two, and then you get to use our, our, our special certificates for your students. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, then you get to become after that, the Reiki master and eventually Karuna Reiki master. Right. And um, it takes about three years to do the whole program. But then what you get to do is advertise your classes in our magazine and on our website. And what people find is that although, you know, you're required to be a teacher for uh, at least a year prior to uh, applying to the program. And what people find is that you at least double the number of students in your classes once you become licensed. So there's a, you know, financial thing too. You know, it, it does cost uh, $500 a month to be in the program. Right. And um, the reason we're charging money, we didn't charge money when we first started. And um, I, I hear, you know, someone's in the program. I haven't heard from a long time. I say, are you, are you still in the program? Oh yeah, yeah, I'm in the program. Oh yeah. And, uh, but they weren't doing anything. They weren't going anywhere with it. But then when we started charging money, everybody's working through the program as fast as they can, because when you're done, you don't, you stop paying the $500 right, a month. Right. So that's the essence of the program. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. It's a serious, it's a serious program. And, and I know once you go through the program, you're a licensed Reiki master teacher with uh, different resources. But I know overall, even if you're not on that path as a Reiki practitioner, level one or two, to be a member of this organization, and as I was, at, and have been for many years, there are there are many benefits and many resources. And you also have a conference every year that you participate in in yeah, Sedona. Yeah, that's right? a the retreat. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I encourage people. I'm going to put the show the link in the show notes to take a a look at the website, and um, you know check out all the training. I know William still does a lot of training uh, himself, which is fantastic. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, thank you for, for that. Is there anything else you wanted to share that I, I didn't ask or I just don't want to leave that out? I mean, the one thing is that we don't, we don't uh, promote or, you know, hard sell our, our, our program. Um, and we feel that people are, would be guided. We only want people who feel uh, spiritually guided to enter the program. And so we say it's not for everyone. Right. And, uh, you know, it's just for people who feel guided. Maybe there's some other path that's better for you. We don't want to divert you from that. So um, we yeah. just say, if you're wondering about it, say prayers, meditate, and then if you feel guided, then you can go ahead and, you know, get into the program. Yeah, that's how I approach um, Reiki. Also, you know, people come get a session and they're like, well, when should I come back? Whenever you feel guided, you know, because yeah. uh -huh. Reiki will guide you. Reiki's present. And yeah. when you when you when you make Reiki a part of your life, it's really, truly life changing as we've seen with your life and um, I know personal experience as well. So I want to thank you, William, for being here uh, on Chat Off the Mat with, with us. And it's been um, a great experience for me and just having you as a teacher in my life has been life-changing and, and Reiki and, and your organization. So thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks thank for you. inviting me. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for joining me on Chat Off the Mat. I hope this conversation has inspired you and has made you curious about ways you can incorporate into your own unique healing journey. Stay connected on social media. Feel free to reach out with your own healing stories or topics you'd like me to explore in future episodes. Your voice is an essential part of this community. Please share this podcast with others. Your support helps me in my intention to help others to embrace their own healing journeys and live their best life. Until next time, this is Rose Whippich sending you love, light, and great energy.